he calls Zoroastrianism the religion of free will par excellence because rooted in the very structure of the universe is this idea of choice. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mind Matters. Today on this show, we will be diving deep into history on the hunt for Zoroaster, the alleged first of the Magi and the prophet whose ideas, we're told, influenced Mahayana Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And if modern historical and archaeological hypotheses are true, he, his influence may have even extended to the Near Eastern and European uh, adoption of agriculture, believe it or not. But to say that Zoroaster had an influence and greatly impacted our modern religious values did, in this day and age is really simply uh, a truism. But on today's show, we want to discuss the time and place that Zoroaster may have lived, the influences that he had, the kind of heroic efforts that we are told he made in order to bring a religion of truth and justice and freedom to a people who we're told were the prey of bandits and warriors, nomads, and sacrificial offerings to priests and who at every turn seem to be inflicted by the wrath of the gods. So on today's show, we each kind of went our own way and read different material. There's so much out there to read uh, concerning Zoroaster and Zoroaster, uh, Zoroastrianism that you can easily get lost if you don't have a, you know, a trusted network of, of buddies who ha can recommend good information to you. And so today, if there's one thing that we hope to impart, it's uh, a number of interesting hypotheses uh, about Zoroaster as well as the the um, the religious ideas that he that he had and how they changed throughout the ages because the original hymns that we have of of Zoroaster the the Gatas um, they don't really tell us a lot about the religion or the rituals or the worldview that Zoroaster had and so it's been centuries uh, a century at least of historical study and archaeological study linguistic study in order to piece together the world that Zoroaster lived in and in in fact the the actual impact that these religious ideas may have had on humanity including um, notions as such as heaven and hell, uh, notions such as the the importance, the prime importance of truth, and the logos in the maintenance of a righteous and well ordered society, and what it means in order to live in the world, what unique values that Zoroaster placed on simply cleaning your house or maintaining a well ordered room, like Jordan Peterson would say, clean your room, the kind of religious significance that this was placed on by Zoroaster uh, and all of his adherents that throughout the ages until the final fall of the religion with the advent of, of Islam and religious persecutions. But that said, he, this individual, mythical or, um, or historical or a combination of both, is in some way a father figure for the Western mind and for not just the Western mind, the Near Eastern mind, the Western mind, and the, the Middle Eastern mind, um, and the great religions and the great, um, and many philosophies as well. So today we thought we would dive deep into that sea and see if we can plumb the depths and find something meaningful and practical that we can bring forward to apply to today. One of the interesting things about Zarathustra is that everyone's heard of his name. Everyone has, well, I think everyone has at least heard his name, but no one really knows. Um, if you just ask a regular person on the street, they won't be able to tell you anything about Zoroastrianism. Um, the reason, or the probably the two main reasons that his name is still known today is thanks to Nietzsche and Strauss. Um, Nietzsche famously wrote a book, um, also Sprach Zarathustra, mm -hmm. and then uh, Strauss wrote a piece famously used in 2001 A Space Odyssey by Kubrick. Um, 
you'd know it when you you'd know it if you heard it if you don't know it by name um and so the name is in popular culture today has filtered down through popular culture to us but you know what remains is what he who he actually was what he actually thought and did which i mean up until recently no one really and by recently i mean the last couple hundred years no one really knew because none of the texts were translated um, one of the books that I've been reading is Paul Krawacek's In Search of Zarathustra. It's kind of like a travelogue history where um, he, th this guy had worked on documentaries and had kind of traveled all over the place and had an interest in Zarathustra. And so it's kind of his journey to, to figure out, to, to kind of track the the influence of Zoroastrianism and Zarathustra in all different cultures, um, you know, from Middle East to Europe and and Eastern and even f further east. And one of the points that he makes, like you kind of alluded to in your intro, Corey, is that even though Zoroastrianism isn't um, isn't practiced today to the extent that it used to have been, and it's not. It's not practiced to the extent of other major world religions. The, not only is there still a Zoroastrian community, um, but the, some of the practices and ideas from that time have been filtered down into the cultures that exist today, even in um, Iran, which is currently an Islamic country, the, the, the original, a lot of the original Zoroastrian um, customs and beliefs and words are still there and have filtered, filtered through the Islamic culture and still kind of retain a place, even if the, the people themselves don't, um, uh, well, don't acknowledge it or, or, or are not even aware of it. So that's one of the cool things about uh, Kroatchek's book is tracing uh, tracing some of these thoughts and how they exist today in not only Iran and Central Asia, but how they influenced certain movements in Europe, for instance, through the kind of the heretical beliefs of the Bogomils and the Cathars, and who who held these from the orthodox christian point of view strange kind of dualistic beliefs about the you know an evil god and a good god and these beliefs seem to tra to track back to uh, an iranian you know zoroastrian belief system and so he kind of goes through some of the theories on how that how that might have taken place how the how the zoroastrian beliefs kind of entered europe um in Bulgaria, through this, through the kind of nomadic Eastern Steppes people, uh, and um, and through the Sarmatians, who were actually responsible for a lot of the Gothic culture, um, it's kind of just a um, an accident of fate that it's called Gothic because it could have just as easily be, have been called Sarmatian, um, because that's essentially who these were, these steppe peoples that. Uh, not only gave birth to Gothic architecture, but even the social structure of of Europe at the time, the kind of the the knightly class, um, feudally ruling over kind of a peasant class, that uh, that came from a, a more Eastern tradition, um, and Kroatchik argues probably Zoroastrian influenced at least, and that. The, like the, the great heresy, as, as it was called, this Cathar belief in southern France, uh, at one point, like a third of the of southern French people um, were followers of this um, kind of alternative Christianity. So it's interesting to, to see that even though uh, the name is forgotten, and it was forgotten even in these times, like the Cathars and the Bogomils were, um, consider themselves Christians, how the ideas still seep through. And that seems to be the case. Um, that's kind of just what ideas do. It doesn't really matter what names get attached to them. The, these currents kind of flow through time and different belief systems and uh, through from different people. And with uh, like a, an, a historian's mind, you can try to track them and see where they originally come from. So um, going back a bit further, um, Maybe we can bring up a couple of the different theories, because like you mentioned, there are competing theories on when Zoro, 
Zoroaster or Zarathustra actually lived. The kind of more mainstream views these days are that he lived or was born, what, maybe like uh, 600 BC or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, 2,600 years ago. And um, another, there's another theory that he was like uh, 30 or 3,000, 3,200, something like that years ago. And then, but it, in some of the ancient Greek writer, uh, Greek writers, Greek sources, they mentioned that he was um, from like, like you said, like almost nine century, nine millennia ago, mm -hmm. like uh, 7,000 BC ish, you know, 6,500 BC, which is really far back in time. So a lot of, a lot of um, modern historians wouldn't, wouldn't go that far. Um, but one who does, um, I don't know, I'm not sure if we've mentioned her before. Um, this is... Mary Sedegast's work, uh, When Zarathustra Spoke. She also wrote a book called Plato Prehistorian. And in this, she argues that um, there might be something to that really um, early date to Zarathustra. Because right around that time, in the archaeological record, we see, these, uh, we see a shift in um, um, settlement patterns, uh, the birth of kind of a new agricultural form of living, and which seems to be a total break from the pre-existing society in this place and time in uh, in Persia, in the you know the Iranian plateau and uh, into se inter Central Asia and Turkey, this is when practices seemed to change remarkably. New practices were introduced, old ones were um, abandoned, and this just happens to coincide with the when these ancient or ancient greek sources say that zarathustra was alive and so she is arguing that the, what we see in the archaeological record is the result of the teachings of this prophet that he basically instituted a new way of life and that's what we're seeing in that historical archaeological record um so she also she's a fan of the um the theory that the indo-european languages um sprung about from like turkish sources now that that's that's what i th what i think is maybe the main weakness of the book is that um well i do think it's very it's very interesting and very uh it's it's very striking more than a coincidence that right around this time in the archaeological record you, you have something happening that matches up with some of the few things that we can know about zarathustra um, like the the emphasis on agriculture and on the 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 bounteous nature of of life and the and the earth and the um, the um, the negative attitude to animal sacrifice to like bull sacrifice which seems to have been in the existing religious substratum that Zarathustra was operating there seemed to have been to have been a lot of um, like uh, animal sacrifice going on and then in the archaeological record we see that disappearing and a new form of life um, taking shape that isn't um, that where, where we don't see so much animal sacrifice you see more of a like a life-giving attitude as a word as opposed to a, a sacrificial one so there's something there for sure there's it's very interesting to see those those come those um, like coincidences like in in the record, um, but at the same time the probably the one weakness is that it's the it seems that nowadays with especially with the new genetics research that's coming out I know we've mentioned uh, David Reich's work um, who we are and how we got here in the past um, the our, the the genetic record seems to suggest that the Indo-European languages the the best the best hypothesis for the spread of the Indo-European Indo languages was from these step, uh, these steps people, but like a couple thousand years after this archaeological revolution that was going on in um, in Iran at the time. So I don't know what I think about that yet, but um, but for sure something weird was going on, mm -hmm. like uh, you know, eighty five hundred years ago, that has some remarkable um, you know correspondences to what we can tell from the from the Gathas, from the early Zoroastrian texts. Yeah. Well, the the suggestion in Sedegast's book uh, and in other places is that Zoroaster was trying to instill in his congregation, in his uh, tribes, the uh, imperative to um, be a good husband, a uh, good caretaker of the land, and to 
have these formations of houses and of uh, developed agriculture that uh, showed respect and a kind of commune with nature. So that's one theory that suggests why it was that there was this kind of nomadic, uh, sporadic signs of civilizations uh, several thousand years ago that had kind of concentrated and and formed these more cohesive uh, areas in which people got together. There were there were towns and cities that uh, agricultural finds suggest were these larger developments at around that time that were attributed to his thoughts and the types of ideas that he was trying to promulgate with his teachings. So we know that uh, this religion was pretty powerful for its time. Uh, there are some people who think that it lasted for about a thousand years until, as you mentioned, you know, the rise of Islam had kind of taken taken that that force, that belief out of the picture for the most part. In thinking about Zoroaster and and what his contributions were to thought, to religion, what his philosophy was, uh, I came to a book called The Hymns of Zoroaster by M. L. West. This is the book. West is a emeritus fellow of All Souls College in Oxford. He's a fellow of the British Academy. And he first begins his book by explaining the difficulty of coming to some kind of right understanding of what Zoroaster was trying to say, given the fact that these are old languages that were being looked at, given the fact that there were other translators and academics in prior times who had come uh, at very different understandings of what Zoroaster's hymns meant. Uh, what he comes to in his introduction, and he says, take it with a grain of salt, is that he himself, in looking at the hymns, was looking for a kind of contextual coherence and finding internally consistent ways within the text to bring about what was or what he thought was the spirit of what the hymns were all about. So this this book is uh, in some way a, a good approach to getting to what Zoroaster was trying to impart on his congregation and we know a number of things because of these translations. Uh, one of the things is that he establishes in the minds of people this idea of a definite objective, moral right and wrong, which he describes as thinking right and, and doing right. Uh, he addresses the Ahura Mazda, which is the, uh, the kind of highest deity, uh, as the mindful Lord. And throughout the book, he addresses the mindful Lord with questions about addressing this or that struggle or conflict in his, in his attempt to preach his own gospel to a greater number of people. Uh, so, there's a great deal of questioning in his text. There's, a, there's the idea that, in all humility, he doesn't have all the answers. And he's imparting this questioning to his own congregation to strive within themselves to create some kind of direct connection to Ahura Mazda in doing the right things, in making the distinction between right and wrong in their daily lives. Zoroaster was also looking for some kind of direction politically. He knew that he needed a, a certain amount of uh, materialistic strength and, and wealth and influence in order to strengthen his religion. 
he was very realistic about that, and that comes through in the hymns as well. So there were a number of uh, interesting parts of the yasnas, which are these, uh, these short poems that are highly structured that, um, that are in the book that convey, I think, his, the spirit of what Zoroaster was all about. So here I'm just going to read a little bit of what begins as West's kind, kind of um, fleshing out of some of these poems that are attributed to Zoroaster or that could have been very well canonized uh, later on by some of his, uh, his followers. In prompting men to do these things, the divas are seducing them away from the peaceful, settled existence in which they are relatively secure from premature death. The divas themselves are misled by the evil will, which makes them think evil. And hence comes the evil speech with which that evil will induces the wrongdoer to take over responsibility for the evil deed. From here on, Zoroaster speaks no more of the divas, only of human evil doers. The powerful man is guilty of many offenses against peace in his efforts to win a name for himself, as a warrior or as a patron of great sacrificial banquets. But these offenses are known to the mindful Lord, who keeps all men's deserts in mind. Wherever he and right are respected, let his edict be broadcast, namely that the good will be rewarded hereafter and the bad punished. According to this edict, the outrages aforementioned, of which Zoroaster declares his own innocence, are capital offenses which, following the trial of the sinner by molten metal, will be visited with the severe penalty that the mindful Lord ordains. These evil practices of cow slaughter go back to Yima, the mythical institutor of animal sacrifice. Zoroaster, being innocent of them, is content to submit himself in the mindful Lord's judgment. And on the other side of the page, just so you can get a sense, are the original parts that, uh, that West kind of fleshes out. Now, when you read this, you, you kind of get the sense that there is a, um, almost an Old Testament uh, sense of right and wrong and judgment that uh, Zoroaster is trying to impart on the people who are listening. And in that sense, I, I thought that his writing, if it is his writing in particular, uh, was highly influential. Yeah, there's a, like I said in, in the intro, the uh, the gatas don't really spell out a an explicit uh, unified cosmology, but uh, you when you read that, there are hints. There are definitely hints of of this cosmology that was held, and it's rooted in the Indo-Iranian um, you know worldview and the the devas. They had their own particular meaning in the in the the Indian uh, cosmology, the Indo-Iranian cosmology, and they were, you know, gods, but they weren't, they were maybe gods of war, gods of things that that uh, Zoroaster himself uh, thought were, were evil. And in his vision, um, in, you know, when he was attaining the the mantle of prophet, he saw that these gods were, were evil and that the, the thing that was evil about them um, was something that was moral. And there was something that was... Uh, that was shared across the the universe, something that divided the universe in two, so that it was not a religion of might makes right, but it was an ethical religion based on um, like like truth and justice, and that the god um, in the gatas, which is slightly different from the god that you know in the later versions. Um, was the god of, of truth, was truth. Ahura Mazda was everything that was light, and that um, Ahura Mazda also had his immortals um, that, would, that were also different aspects of what it meant to be a good being, a good, a good being of anything, you know, the, the rightful order. Um, and uh, I can't remember all of the, the seven different immortals, all the different aspects of, of truth. But... 
um, that this was the duality. It wasn't. A, it was an interesting duality in the sense that it wasn't matter versus spirit, um, but it was a duality that was shared uh, and uh, a struggle that was instituted by these twin spirits of the the truth versus the lie. Though not quite sure where the lie comes from um, to to start with, uh, but the truth and the lie were at odds against one another since the time of creation because Ahura Mazda fashioned the world and then the uh, the lie saw its opportunity to attack because now that there was matter there was the opportunity to inflict pain and suffering and so from that moment on all of creation was mixed with the evil force and the good force doing battle eternally and that everything in the universe was in some way connected to that and a symbol of that so if you were a man and you were behaving in these ways that were ethically uh, questionable like um, even you know men who uh, weren't doing their own job you know things like uh, things like that, men who weren't taking care of the cattle or they were they weren't working or they were lying these these individuals were um, conduits for the forces of evil, and the more that you embraced this, then you would be judged in the you know the on the bridge of judgment or you know something along those lines in the in the afterlife and if the scales are wanting, then you go to the house of the lie. Whereas if you do more virtuous things and you are um, you have attained you have been a conduit for the truth, then you go to the house of the truth. But the this sequence of the creation of the universe and then the mixture of evil and good in this creation because of evil's opportunistic sense to inflict suffering would then someday in the future result in the separation once again between those individuals who made the choice to pursue the truth versus those individuals who made the choice to pursue evil. And so as a human being, it was your duty to pursue the truth, but not only just for yourself, but even matter um, matter itself could be perfected and uh, you could help matter on its way to you know finding its its own way out of the grasp of evil which is just such an interesting um interesting value an interesting idea to have that that i see why mary sedagast in her book the uh, when zarathustra spoke could see that this could be a, a a main driving force behind individuals cultivating the land and beginning to uh, use advanced uh, fire kilns in order to create pottery and really informing matter like pottery in a way that was designed to help the matter itself escaped the clutches of evil by teaching it something, by turning it into something that is beautiful, because that was your job as a human being was to assist all of creation in the, in the battle, the daily battle, uh, between this cosmic, these cosmic forces, these, these twin spirits of, of the truth and the lie. One of the things that... Um one of the great scholars of Zoroastrianism, R.C. Zeiner, says, uh, this is from the Dawn and Twilight of Zoroastrianism, he calls Zoroastrianism the religion of free will par excellence, because rooted in the very structure of the universe is this idea of choice. So it was, uh, well, arguably, that's probably where we get a lot of our modern ideas about free will is from this Zoro, from Zarathustra, this ancient prophet, that there is a choice to be made and that the, the, the world is not deterministic. So everything isn't um, predetermined by God, for instance, like you see in a lot of later theologies. Um, what it really comes down to is the choice of each person to, to um, what you know what they're going to do in their lives which which force they're going to align themselves with the truth or the lie and i want to get into some of the 
some of the kind of practicalities and how, how the belief system kind of took shape because there were several periods to Zoroastrianism. Like there's the early ones that we try to, that like uh, in the hymns that we try to divine, you know, what was the, what were the original teachings. And then for hundreds or thousands of years, depending on the, the timeline you're looking at, there's a whole series of developments that can be discerned in the texts to some degree to the point where we get to the kind of the last few hundred years of Zoroastrianism. So before the, before Islam became a thing and uh, kind of conquered the region. So one of these texts from this period, the, uh, I think it's called the Sassananian period when the, the Iranian rulers of that time kind of reinstituted Zoroastrianism after the, the kind of 500 years of seeming neglect after the, um, the con uh, after the region was conquered by Alexander the Great. So the, there was kind of a, a renewed push to reinstitute Zoroastrianism as the kind of state religion. Um, something that Kroacek talks in, about in his book, about there was this kind of, um, this head priest guy who seemed to be kind of a, a slightly nefarious figure who was kind of behind reinstituting the, the religion and, and kind of in a totalitarian form. But you can get an idea of what the belief system was like and what the Zoroastrians actually kind of believed and practiced. So that's where this book comes into play. Um, Teachings of the Magi, also by Ziner. And in this one, he, he kind of, he's not looking at those early periods. He's looking at the kind of the form that Zoroastrianism took in these, in this kind of, um, in these last hundred years, last few hundred years of the, of the, of the religion, essentially. And so in the, um, there's this one document called the, the select councils of the ancient sages that kind of lays out the, the core beliefs and practices of Zoroastrians. So this is framed as what, what a, um, a good Zoroastrian should believe by the age of 15. So the questions they should be asking and the answers they should have, you know, questions like, um, who am I, to whom do I belong, from whence have I come, and whither do I return, uh, from what stock and lineage, lineage am I, what is my function and duty on earth, etc. And so then it gives the answers. And it's very interesting the kind of things that this document actually shows. So if, I'll, I'll read a few passages and then maybe um, some of what some of Ziner's commentary. So, for instance, the document says, "My first duty on earth is to confess the religion, to practice it, and to take part in its worship, and to be steadfast in it, to keep the faith in the good religion of the worshippers of Ormajd ever in mind, and to distinguish profit from loss, sin from good works." goodness from evil, light from darkness, and the worship of Ormajd from the worship of the demons. My second duty is to take a wife and to procreate earthly offspring and to be st strenuous and steadfast in this. My third duty is to cultivate and till the soil. My fourth, to treat all livestock justly. My fifth, to spend a third of my days and nights in attending the seminary and consulting the wisdom of holy men to spend a third of my days and nights in tilling the soil and in making it fruitful, and to spend the remaining third of my days and nights in eating, rest, and enjoyment. So one of the comments that Zeiner makes is that Zoroastrianism is, um, is a very earthy religion, like quite literally, um, in agriculture, but also in its, um, in its kind of, uh, well, it, it's unlike the kind of Gnostic um, Gnostic beliefs and religions that came up after Christianity, like those early Christian Gnostic groups and the, um, like the Cathars and the Bogomils, who saw the physical world as evil incarnate, the, the creation of an evil being. The Zoroastrians saw the earth, uh, like the material world, as good in nature. And to be, um, so not to be um, just written off as this evil creation that must be like killed or overcome, but actually this is the, this is the life we have and we have to actually, um, live it and live it well. And that there, there is goodness in the earth and that is expressed in like the, the bounteous nature of, of, of the soil. You, you find this in, in Christianity too. If you look in the gospel of Mark or in the, the writings of Paul, the, like the, in, in Mark, for instance, the parable of the sower, there, there is this central idea in Christianity of the the good earth, you know, the the good the the earth that brings forth, um, you know, plants essentially good fruit. That there is something in inherently good about the about life 
about the about the the soil in which life grows and you find this early on in Zoroastrianism and even the the idea that um, you know one of the one of the main duties of the Zoroastrian is to um, you know to to make babies <laughs> it's like the the Cathars on the other hand were um, like to, to be a perfect which was one of the the kind of sages of the Cathars you had to um, avoid any kind of uh, you know fornication or children because that would be that was just um, that to to do so would be to like to actually have children would be to to create more vessels more evil vessels to to entrap human souls so there's a the, like the, there's a very cynical attitude in a lot of the Gnostic beliefs that that arguably did were that arguably were influenced by Zoroastrianism as opposed to the original idea which was very kind of pro um, pro matter and pro life that but but not to the extent of just everything's rosy because the earth still was a battlefield um, it was in the it was but but it was a battlefield like in each individual mm -hmm. in the choices that they made what the that, that was how to um, how to defeat evil was basically the the a human a human being living their life and um, living their their life in good thought, good words, and good deeds. That was the, the, how the battle was won. Was through the kind of manifestation of goodness in the earth, in in the world. So, one of the some of the other things that uh, that are in this document, I want to read. So it says, "For it is plain that of thoughts, words, and deeds, it is deeds only that are the criterion. For the will is unstable." Thought is impalpable, but deeds are palpable indeed. And by the deeds that men do, are they made known? So here we have, again, Zoro Zoroastrianism, um, probably the origin of the idea that um, you should be known by your deeds and not by your words, judged by your deeds and not by your words. Um, it's not strictly by your words. In, there was this kind of unified ideal in Zoroastrianism. Um, I mentioned it, good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. It was important to have all three. So your intentions didn't really matter. If you were just a person with good intentions that didn't actually do anything, that was kind of worthless. Um, the most important thing was actually to get things done, to actually live the life of um, live a life of kind of truth and goodness, and to to actually manifest that in the in the way you live your life. Well, I'll go to Zeiner's commentary on it. He kind of summarizes what's going on here. So over against God stands the devil, Ariman. He, like God, is a pure spirit. He and Ormajd, Ahuramajd, Ahura Mazda, um, are eternal et antagonists, and sooner or later a struggle between them becomes inevitable. God is all goodness and light, Ariman all wickedness and death, darkness and deceit. We shall see later how God is forced to create the universe as a weapon with which to defeat Ariman. So the universe is actually, the, the reason for the material world is actually it is a creation of God in order to defeat evil. So again, very, very much at odds with the Gnostic belief that the, that the material world is the creation of the devil and therefore something to be, you know, like uh, trampled on and spat upon. It's a uh, no, that the, the world is the, not only the, the soil in which, you know, goodness can grow, but it's actually for the express purpose of defeating evil. That's the, the purpose for the material world. It's like a trap, um, as Zeiner describes, uh, as Zeiner describes it, a trap in which to, um, um, to kind of lure evil that, so that it can then be defeated. So, um, so as he writes, um, being God's creation, man belongs to him, but God nonetheless depends on man's help in order to, to defeat his eternal adversary. Evil is not by any means identified with matter, as in the case with the Manichaeans. So this is what, uh, what, this is where he says what I just kind of paraphrased. It is a trap set by God for the devil, a trap in which the latter is enmeshed and which so weakens him that in the end, Ormaj is enabled to deal him the death blow. So, uh, you know, a very interesting just way of looking at the world that, that you don't, that I haven't really seen expressed explicitly in any other kind of mainstream religion. Um, at least not uh, in any kind of popular, um, well-known way. It's a, it's, 
so y when you look at when you kind of get into this stuff and read read what these what the Zoroastrians actually believed, it's a it's well on one level it's just interesting to see the the kind of strange strange worldview that that's kind of uncommon, but which the, it's it's almost like. Um, like some kind of weird fantasy, like sci-fi world, where they've set up the the rules of the game, the rules of the world, the the rules of the system of of what's going on. That's just a it's a very interesting world to find yourself in, mm -hmm. where you are the you are the um, like the ground of the battle. You are the, at the forefront of the the battle against evil, and it's taking place within you, mm -hmm. and that it all has to do with your choices and how you manifest yourself in the world. So, um, as this, I'm going to read again from Zeiner, as this little text shows, man's role in the world is to cooperate with nature on the natural plane and to lead a virtuous life of good thoughts, good words, and good deeds on the moral plane. Thus, no religion has been as strongly opposed to all forms of asceticism and, and monasticism as was Zoroastrianism. It is man's bounden duty to take himself a wife and to rear up for himself sons and daughters for the very simple reason that human life on earth is a sheer necessity if Ahriman is to be defeated. Similarly, no other religion makes a positive virtue of agriculture, making the earth fruitful, strong, and abundant in order to resist the onslaught of the enemy, who is the author of disease and death. On the natural plane, then, virtue is synonymous with fruitfulness, vice with sterility. Celibacy, therefore, is both unnatural and wicked. On the moral plane, all the emphasis is on the righteousness is on righteousness or truth, for evil is personified as the lie, and on doing uh, of good works, in which Ormage himself has his dwelling. For, as the author of our little text sensibly remarks, deeds are the only criterion which alone, um, by which alone, a man can be judged. So. You can actually see some of the um, some of the influence of Zoroastrianism on the kind of the, uh, on the mainstream religions on Christianity today, for instance. There is the um, so while it may be kind of foreign in some ways when you're looking at it, there are still things that kind of seep through, like this idea that I haven't mentioned yet of the the end of the world, the the eschaton, the the you know the apocalypse, the end of the world. That's a Zoroastrian idea, the idea that there will be a time when like a reckoning. Uh, a time to come when there will be a great judgment and a great transformation of of the of of creation. That's a Zoroastrian idea. Um, the idea of the resurrection of the dead. Um, again, a, a Zoroastrian idea. Probably um, one that that was the source for that idea in Judaism first, and then in Christianity. <clears throat> so again, we see these ideas kind of seeping through, and um, um, and expressing themselves in these new in these new clothes essentially with these new religions that uh, that sprung up, but that there is this kind of seed of these original ideas within uh, still within them that has that has carried on for all those for all these years so that we we still even mainstream um, you know Christianity even mainstream religions today the the big monotheisms that ha that have you know billions of followers are still uh, some of their central ideas can be traced back to you know Zarathustra, which should come as kind of a surprise to a lot of people, I think. Well, in reading about Zoroaster's ideas, one thing that came very strongly across was that he was he was a reformer. He was trying to moderate the more kinds of extreme and unproductive and destructive uh, elements of of living among his people with with these ideas that he was inspired to share because the idea is that he was uh or had an experience or a vision that had or was the impetus for him to to begin uh as a uh as a kind of um progenitor of of his own religion um so in that sense he he has something in common i think with uh, the Apostle Paul, which reminded me a bit of a book that I'd been reading just recently by Timothy Ashworth. It's called um, Paul's Necessary Sin, The Experience of Liberation. And in that book, he explains that he was trying to 
he says, all, all my attention was engaged with the interrelationships of different words and contexts in the text itself, which also reminded me of this book that I was reading from a little earlier by M.L. West, who was also trying to bring what is the, the spirit of Zoro, Zoroaster's ideas forward. So that even if there were these uh, literal things that may be uh, missed in the translation, there's something, there's some strength in, in these texts that people who have looked at other translations and people who have given deep thought to uh, early Christianity, or in this case, Zoroasterism, have in recent years been able to convey with their uh, their own understanding. And so it, it it's very interesting to me that, that you have these two different uh, translations of different religions that are both trying to convey what is the, the spirit of the religion. And I think that Sedegas does this too in when Zarathustra spoke, because by the end of the book, she's also affirming agriculture as this uh, Zoroastrian-inspired uh, commune with the earth, which she attributes to the, um, the, the advent of alchemy and this kind of understanding of the spiritualization of matter uh, that that all of the alchemists and even famous scientists like Isaac Newton and, and others were all inspired uh, by this kind of long lineage and respect for the material world to, to get at its very essence, to get at its, its most uh, spiritual form, if you will. And this speaks, I think, to uh, Zoroaster's um, very practical uh, idea of working with what we have, of, of not looking forward necessarily to the eschaton or to when judgment would come, but to have that kind of figure into his own thinking about being his own uh, panerologist, if you will, there, of, of weeding out all of those corrupting elements in his own society, all of those priests who were conveying and sharing lies that were damaging to his people. Uh, all of the naysayers and and raiders of other people's herds and cattle, on on every level, he was trying to reform his society, first with his own congregation, and then with perhaps the wider tribe that he was surrounded by, and then even the hope was that that this kind of new morality that he was sharing would spread out to even larger areas, which is exactly what happened. So very impressive. And I think we'll, we can get into that a little bit uh, in a part two, uh, which is what we plan to do for the next show. <clears throat> well, yes, we do. Uh, hopefully we will be able to do a part two on the show because it's a very fascinating topic. And uh, we hope that, you know, as you're listening to this, uh, you'll get a chance to uh, Take a look down below and see some of the the books, some of the material that we've been referencing. And if if you're interested in the you know in the value system, and you're interested in kind of contending with different value systems and how uh, history and just randomness has has changed some of these values, and seeing maybe where they where they took shape, what they first may have looked like, um, what in, initially inspired um, individuals to, to believe in a, a monotheistic uh, gods. Uh, this is uh, definitely a place, definitely a place uh, to, start, to start that search. And on that note, we hope that you share this with everyone on Facebook, and you like it, <laughs> and then you share it on Twitter, and then um, you have a great week. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you again next time.